Welcome to Post Doom, regenerative conversations exploring overshoot grief, grounding, and gratitude. I'm Michael Dowd, your host. And in this conversation, I speak with a dear brother, Gia Woodbury. He's become a dear brother since this conversation. We spoke in April of 2020, and Gia is an eco-psychologist, an eco-attorney, he's a Gaian advocate, just a big-hearted Dharma practitioner, and he's somebody who brings together a deep understanding of these large-scale systems, and also a sense of, of, of uh, and he's written along the lines of anxiety and trauma, and uh, healing our collective traumas, and healing our world, and how they interrelate. Enjoy this conversation. I'd, I'd like to ask you at the start, for people who haven't read your writings, they haven't seen you, they don't know who you are, help us get you. Uh, don't be bashful because you actually have some really amazing stuff that I want folks to know about. So uh, let us know a little bit uh, sort of about who you are, what you bring to the world, and what you're particularly passionate about or um, concerned about at these times. You want to get me, Michael? If you want to get I, me, I, I do. To get me, then, then you're going to have to indulge this old Buddhist soul who doesn't particularly enjoy reconstructing a self that doesn't exist. I understand that. What I, what I would, um, what I'm going to ask instead, um, because our whole world has basically changed in the last two or three weeks, I'm going to ask you if we can start from where we are with the idea that if we actually can bring this present moment into focus, then it will be really clear where we've come from and how we got into this predicament and how we can possibly get out of it. That, so that I mean, works that for me. I promise to you and your listeners, if you will spare me the blah, blah of saying, well, I was born, you know, I mean, I, I know you're not asking that, I just feel like the moment is um, heart attack serious right now. And there's this giant elephant standing in the room where you can't see me, he's out of range here, but he's standing in the room staring at me. And it'd be really hard for me not to talk about him. That's great. Let's start right here with the present moment. So I appreciate appreciate your, your show and you having me on and the timing is not coincidental. I, um, you have had some of the people on your show that have been instrumental in forming my own thinking. Joanna, of course, is like my dear, dear to my heart. And um, she is actually kind of the reason that I'm sitting here at all. And that's, an, that's a story we can come back to to fill in the, uh, the backstory. But you also had um, um, Stephen Jenkinson, who we all know as, and love as the grief walker. And as a longtime Dharma practitioner, uh, I had the in incredible good fortune of coming across him, his work, when I was training at Zen Hospice in San Francisco about six years ago now, seven, no, seven years ago. And so what, what anybody who knows anything about Stephen Jenkinson knows that he basically says we live in a death phobic culture. This has been his message exactly. and this is what makes him different. Even for hospice workers, hospice care providers, you know, we were blown away by his take on palliative care and, and hospice, right? So what, so, so at that time, I was studying eco-psychology and spiritual counseling and, and going deep in um, Dharma um, study as well, the study of the turning to the wheel. And, um, but the reason that I was in San Francisco, the reason I was, went back to school there was because of um, Zen Hospice. And it's a world-renowned training program, and I had been doing hospice for a while. And so I had the good fortune of serving 
people who were dying first from the kitchen, volunteering in the kitchen and preparing meals for people who are dying, which in itself is like this profoundly transformative experience. I would imagine. And then I was able to go through the training program and to be trained in how to sit at the bedside of someone who's dying, or really how to enter the threshold of a room where somebody is dying, because that's an incredible privilege. And mm -hmm. Stephen Jenkinson certainly understands that. Before he was known as Grief Walker, I believe he was known as the angel of death. Yes. Because he had this mystical ability to show up at somebody's bedside right when they were dying. And he's done that like a thousand, over a thousand times. So, um, I was at the time, um, doing what I've always wanted to do, studying what I've always wanted to study, living in a place that I've always wanted to live in, blocks from Ocean Beach, beginning my days walking along the Pacific Ocean with my golden retriever, my golden lab, Garuda, and then going and studying at California Institute of Integral Studies, which is like this think tank of compassion yes. in the midst of the mission district, the midst of misery <laughs> and, and squalor and desperation um, with the most brilliant minds, Brian Swim, uh, um, Stan Groff, you know, like, and, and I'll tell you something, the five hours a week that I went into that house as on hospice was what I looked forward to the most. I was writing. I love. I'm a writer. I love. I was doing everything I love. But the thing I looked forward to the most every week was going to Zen Hospice. And you, as a minister, I think you've probably done chaplaincy work. I imagine with yes, with dying people. Well, at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, which is one of the better children's hospitals, it was a grueling experience and one of the most important emotional experiences of my life, because I had two young children at the time. And I would come home after dealing with all of this, supporting these families, you know, with, you know, leukemia, little kids and all. And I would come home and sometimes just lay my head on my wife's lap and just cry. And so how would you describe, what would you describe as the essence of the hospice experience? Listening, being present, and um, being as compassionate as I could be. Just, it, it wasn't so much what I would say, it was just who I was being. And it, to the degree that I could be comfort and compassion and generosity, um, life, God, reality, the universe um, was occasionally able to use me in a, in a nurturing way in a very, very painful, difficult situation. It may have been quite different for you visiting children in a hospital. And so I, I guess, you know, let me describe for you, you know, the experience of going into a, an old Victorian home in, uh, in San Francisco, uh, the Edward Conza house, it's actually called, uh, with six beds upstairs, um, three of which usually ha were reserved for a hospital that would bring in underprivileged, like people that could have been street, you know, like homeless. And then the other three were paid for by people that had enough money to actually pay to, to go to have one of those beds. So usually from a very affluent background. So you mm -hmm. had a equal mix and then you had the nurses and staff and volunteers and um, walking and kitchen people. Yeah. So walking into that home um, was uh, different than, just like walking into a nursing home is different than yeah. any other experience anywhere in the world. You walk into those places and there's people relate to each other in a fundamentally different way. Yes. There's no pretense. When you're yes. dying, yes. you have no patience for pretense. Yeah. And you're faced with all the big questions of life, the existential questions and life review and all of this and losing your loved ones. And so being with those people, you have to be in that space with them. 
it was equal parts joy and sadness, sorrow and grace, laughter and tears. There were, there was never one without the other. Yeah. And it was, it was the reason that I enjoyed that experience so much was because I never felt more alive yeah. than when I was tending and being with the dying people. And, pe and people who are taking care of them. Yeah. And of course, there's all kinds of things that go into that, such as not assuming that they're going to die before you. That's one of the first things you learn in hospice is that don't assume just because they're dying that you're going to outlive them because you could end up being shot down the street as soon as you leave today. So you became very painfully aware of the fact of your own impermanence because that's the only thing that will allow you into the space of the person who's dying and grieving and searching for meaning, right? Mm -hmm. So I call that death-informed life. Yes. Wow, I like that, death-informed life. Right. That's what you experience in hospice. Yes. Well, allow me to welcome you and all of your listeners to planetary hospice. Yes. Because that's what's different in the world today than the world two months ago. Yeah. People have been forced by this virus to live in a death informed world where death is as close as the front door. Yeah. When I walk out and go for a walk or go to the grocery store, and I'm in ground zero here, Snohomish County, Washington, mm -hmm. where we had the first incident of coronavirus on January 19th. Mm -hmm. When I walk out that door and go to the grocery store, not only I am aware that death is out there, everybody else is as well. Yeah. And everybody is looking at each other differently. Everybody is relating to each other differently. You're having profound conversations at six feet distance from each other that you never had with strangers, <laughs> with total strangers. Yes, right? exactly. This is what this is planetary hospice. This is what I train for. <laughs> you know? And you and I and Stephen and Joanna and Dar Jamal and, and millions of other people around the world have been living this death informed life for years now because we are aware of what's happening on the planet of which we are a part. Yes which we are an integral part. What jo Joanna, I love, she calls that what the larger body, I call it our host organism, Yes, you know, is ill. And so we've been living planetary hospice. And when I wrote that paper back in 2014, Joanna put it on her website and it went viral and translated into all these languages. And by all the people who understood predicament and the situation and the time that we are living in right now. Yes. Now there so there's this so there's that death informed life and now everybody else is leading a death informed life and it's just beginning. We're just at the start of this ordeal. But um, nobody's quite sure why it feels so different. What the world, everybody is kind of in agreement that the world that we've been living in ended about two months ago. You know, different places, different times, right? I mean, obviously, yes. Spain and Italy, are, they're in a total different stage of grief right now. We're all in that sort of shock and um, denial stage of grief when you've lost something. We've lost a world. We've lost the world that we call business as usual. Yes. And, and people are trying to like wrap their minds around that. And is that real or is that, is, is this just temporary? So yeah. permit me, um, if you will, to explain why this feels so different than everything that came before, even for those of us who have been death informed, li living death informed lives for some time now, right? I mean, 
it feels really different to us too, right? Yes. Okay. So I've been following the climate crisis as someone with a scientific background and a career in law um, since the beginning, which is to say since um, the ozone hole opened up. And most people go back to James Hansen testifying in 1988 to Congress about global warming. But rea in reality, if you look at it, it began um, with the uh, discovery that, oh my God, our hairspray was opening up a hole in the troposphere. <laughs> How in the world, like what? And here we were in the 80s, but the full buff, you know, all the wild hairstyles with moose and tons of hair, and we had to give up hairspray in order to, you know, right? I mean, that was the beginning of climate change. Yeah. So anyways, um, I've been following it all, all along. And at first it was very theoretical and nobody wanted to really hear about it. Or when, you know, it was just like charts and graphs and here's the Keeling curve and look at where, oh, mm -hmm. you know, it's like exponential. Oh well, yeah, you know, exponential human population growth, exponential fossil mm -hmm. fuel use, exponential CO2 emissions, right? That, that was very theoretical. Mm -hmm. Then not that long ago, I'd say like beginning around 2010, really kind of beginning with Barack Obama um, coming into office, it became very apparent to people that we were experiencing geophysical symptoms of, of a climate that was unraveling. And by that, like storms, it took us a little while to figure it out, but all of us in the hurricanes were not the hurricanes that we were used to in frequency or strength. I have, um, I made a career out of um, uh, advocating for wildlife and wild places. So wildfires, uh, and in Montana, where Dr. Running was basically showing us, look, the wildfire season is not the wildfire season that we that these that these trees and forests uh, evolved with. Okay. They're different now, and we started seeing that, you know, and, and experiencing that very palpably in Montana with the fire seasons, and like you had out here a few years ago, even right mm -hmm. uh, on the West Coast in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so we saw geophysical symptoms and everybody became very concerned that started listening to the scientists because you know the oceans are rising the you know Dar Jamal's ice caps and, and glaciers are retreating I glacier national park in Montana I keep saying we need to change it to waterfall national park there aren't any glaciers but there's lots of waterfalls where the glaciers used to be yes why are we still calling it that you know so we started seeing the symptoms of a of a climate chaos mm -hmm. and, and it's very disconcerting and then and then the um, IPCC started getting straight with people and telling us we've got you know actually as far back as 2008 we've got eight years to tra radically transform this this started then affecting people psychologically yeah. all of a sudden and now, and I, I wrote a book on, uh, on, on climate grief, you know, the stages of climate grief and how to process our, feel, our difficult feelings towards the climate. So people, we, you know, we, even the APA recognized, you know, oh, there's eco-anxiety now as an official <laughs> disorder. All right. And so this is, and then Greta came along, who's the poster child for climate trauma. Mm -hmm. She actually is the only human being I'm aware of that has had the appropriate response Mm -hmm. to uh, reality, the climate, to the trauma that we're all uh, experiencing together. So, but here's the thing, okay? As our, our survival instinct, the way we're wired is that we, when we experience something that's threatening, especially an existential threat like this, we reflexively want to push it away and externalize it and see it as something out there that's not really a threat to me in here, right? This is the sort of Cartesian scientific materialist worldview that we've been enculturated into that wants to see, think climate change is melting glacier caps, those poor grizzly, those poor polar bears. Um, you know, unfortunately in Africa, they're kind of on the front line of, of extreme drought and all of that. And those floods in Pakistan, it's easy with the geophysical stuff to see it as something that's still out there, but I live in a gated community, blah, 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 blah. Right. It's not affecting me here. Then Greta, Greta comes along, even, and this is so interesting, even with the psychological impacts, we externalize, we still externalize the threat. The whole, 
I just actually wrote a paper, uh, published a paper with Craig Chalkwist and Linda Bazell, taking on the APA over the, the idea that eco anxiety is a disorder, a mental disorder. Like, what is, and because you know how they talk about it, they literally say that the climate is a threat to our mental health and our mental well being. The climate is the threat to us. I mean, come on, is that not the sign of like externalizing the threat? It's something out there and it's threatening me. Not that somehow we are that and we are causing that or it's, it's a personal crisis. So even with psychological impacts and even with the publication of David Wallace Wells' Uninhabitable Earth, which really hit people hard, mm -hmm. millions of people read that in the first couple of weeks and went, they all mm -hmm. kind of got there with us and said, whoa, yeah. you know, the, psycho the psychological impact of that was difficult. But guess what? Now we're experiencing physical symptoms. Yeah. We are experiencing physically the climate crisis in a way that actually mirrors the symptoms at a microscopic level, the macro symptoms of elevated temperature, fever, damaged lungs, mm. Mm. getting flooded by fluids, by unnatural flooding, the prospect of dying and losing our beloveds, losing our beloved others. Those are the symptoms of climate trauma that Gaia has been experiencing all along. And in order to get our attention, she is in her, in her amazing intelligence has decided to share those symptoms with us in a way that makes it very clear there is no separation between me and you. We are I all this together and we are either gonna go down together or we're going to turn this around. Yeah. This is the message of the coronavirus. It's not a one-off event. You can't externalize it. It's slowed us down. It has slowed the world down. Excuse me, my children. Put your planes down. Leave your cars at home. Face your lives face those questions and you know like the meme says go to your room and think about this yes. the whole world the whole species yes. is in lockdown now because we're experiencing directly physically the climate crisis even now the people are trying to say oh it's like Coronavirus is like the climate crisis. No, coronavirus is the climate crisis. It signifies the beginning of the great dying. Yes. 2.0. This is the first wave of exactly what you would experience with a great dying that we saw at the end of the Pleistocene, you know? Mm -hmm. It happens in waves, just like the oceans don't rise steadily all at once, it happens in surges. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, that ant land is gone. If we, if we, when we finally appreciate what is happening in the present moment, and we're not going to appreciate it till we get to a later stage of the grieving process, mm -hmm. we have to go through the anger and the bargaining before we get to uh, depression and acceptance, mm -hmm. right? But right now, you know, like we, we who have been observing this all along we have to be sort of the midwives and the guides now to say, look here, this is Gaia's trauma that we're feeling. Yes. This is our mother. We're all worried about losing our mothers right now. My mother's 92 years old. I know if she gets this, she's probably a goner, you know? Mm -hmm. This is Gaia's way of telling us, you know, you're gonna lose your mother mm -hmm. if you don't Wake up and realize who you are. Realize as a species who you are and why you're here, right? So 
this is the elephant that I wanted to start yes. with. Yes. Because it's only through this clarifying lens that we can appreciate the urgency of this moment and hear the message, the messages that have been coming across for some time, but now are no longer, we can no longer deny it and we can no longer externalize it. it it's, it's here, it's us. We are inseparable interpenetratingly interdependent mm -hmm. with the living organism that is our planet. Mm -hmm. And only when we begin to see ourselves that way, in that integral way of seeing ourselves as part of this larger organism, only then can we actually um, see the situation in a way that lends itself to solutions and going forth and going forward. And so this is our moment. Yes. This is planetary hospice. This is the beginning of the great dying. And we're all being asked. We've slowed, we've slowed the world down. We've slowed our lives down. Mm -hmm. We're slowing, we will start to slow our thinking down. It feels like time itself is slowing down. Mm. And as the mystic of our times, Thomas Hubel says, when, when we slow our minds down, truth has a chance to emerge. Mm. That's the process we're going into now is everything's being slowed down so that we have a chance. Yes will allow the truth to emerge because, because Gaia loves us, because it's, it's tough love and hard, harsh medicine, but it's actually quite gentle. If you think, if you compare it, if we don't do anything, this first wave of this first pandemic is gonna look quite mild in retrospect when we get to the second, third and fourth waves. Absolutely. So it's a gentle nudge of, uh, okay, it's affecting your populations now. Your exponential population growth is now starting to go off the Malthusian cliff. And um, let's come into proper relations. That's, that's basically what we're being asked to do. And we're also, we're also being asked the question that Pope Francis tried to raise in Laudato Si a few years back, which is, what does it mean to be human in this day and age, in this Anthropocene, mm. this human-shaped age? We have to answer that that question, each of us individually, and, and then come to some sort of consensus on, on an answer that is salutary, an answer that was, is redemptive. Yes. An, an answer that will allow us to um, plow all this adversity into the path and uh, get through a messy, a messy birth process and allow something beautiful to emerge out the other side. Yeah, and in my world, that includes the possibility that we have set in motion certain runaway um, feedbacks that could very well lead to our extinction. And part of the redemption, part of the redemptive process, it seems to me, is truly living out of that understanding of who we are, where we are in time and space, and why we are. My short answers to that, who we are, we are the universe. We are life becoming conscious of itself. We're part of the body of life. We're not its masters and not separate from it and not superior to it. Where we are, we're, you know, sort of at the center of the universe, the omnicentric universe that Brian Swim speaks about and others. But we're also at the end of uh, the Cenozoic era that we've, that we have, um, we are bringing to end the 65 million year era 
uh, we're changing the geology, biology, chemistry, and driving species into extinction at that scale. And um, whether there is an ecozoic era, as Thomas Berry and Brian Swim have articulated, or whether this is the extinction of our species, uh, only time will tell. It might be uh, even out of our hands at this point, but it seems to me recognizing that we are at a pivotal moment in terms of the redemption of our species, this is my language, um, the redemption of our species within the body of life. And part of that is kind of the prodigal species coming home to life as divine. And then why are we? We exist, you know, traditional religious answers are, you know, to serve God and love God forever. Well, if you demystify that or, or, or incarnationalize that, to love life and serve life, to serve this larger body, um, with all of our souls, mind, and strength. And um, I just had a conversation just an hour ago with, with Roger Halem, uh, co-founder of the Extinction Rebellion. And he spoke about the radical difference. He actually echoed some of the things you were just talking about, um, that when we don't operate out of a scientific materialism that's all uh, sort of instrumental, um, it looks, you know, from a purely fact-based perspective, the odds against us are stacked enormously. We, 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 we resist because we must. It's, the, it's the, the mother of all moral imperatives to speak on behalf of life, to speak on behalf of the future, to speak with unflinching moral authority, and to do what we can to resist these powers that are uh, for short-term corporate uh, self-interest uh, collapsing the biosphere and everything that's important to us and our, to our children. So. Let, let me ask. Let me ask you. Did Roger, take, um, on behalf of Extinction Rebellion, declare victory? He didn't. He 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 was very clear that he was speaking on behalf of himself, not as an official spokesman for uh, Extinction Rebellion. But he well, no. But he, Extinction Rebellion. The purpose of Extinction Rebellion is to disrupt business as usual. <laughs> So, so why aren't they declaring victory? <laughs> but probably because he's, you know, as passionate and prophetic as he could be, I think he's a little more humble than to try to take credit for that. But well, but maybe you could take credit in collaboration with Mother with Nature. With Gaia, exactly. Right. We have succeeded in disrupting business as usual. I mean, politically, isn't this the place to to? I mean, isn't that what you need to do in order to accomplish? Okay. I'm I'm kidding with you, but I'm also no. I get it. I actively conspire with Extinction Rebellion through Indra Adnan and others, but I want to I want to stop stop you and go back to the way you began that with the feedback loops, you know, and the sort of the description of the situation that we're facing, the predicament that we're in. Right? You need to have Kritikenko, a, a climate scientist from India that works for Environmental Defense Fund, and is right now recovering from coronavirus on your program and ask her about um, feedback loops. What's and her name again? Pretty Kanko. We all, I'll, give, I'll get you your her. Okay. And she's also a Zen priest. And so she's also very skill, skilled and uh, she's also just a beautiful human being mm -hmm. um, in Boulder, Colorado. So, but she will tell you, you know, yeah, we've, we've crossed these tipping. She has a slide where she'll show you all the different sort of feedback loops and tipping points, you know, well, we have crossed the, it appears we've crossed the tipping point for uh, um, um, melt for a uh, blue ocean or whatever in the Antarctic. I think mm -hmm. that's one. But there's all these other ones that we. Can get. But, but here's the thing, you know, like so in all those projections for the IPCC, um, how did they account for uh, coronavirus? Did, they, did their model show that we were going to have a 25% reduction in CO2 emissions in two months? <laughs> nope. Okay. So what's the point of pretending that we know the future? Where does that get us? You know, these, I had this thing where I obviously came into it through science, through reading National Academy of Science reports as part of my work for many years, and then et cetera, et cetera, at some point with climate science, which is a fairly recent new discipline, you know, it's not like, it's not like uh, physics, really. <laughs> I mean, it is physics, but, but it's, you know, like ask a climate scientist, so what is the effect of a change in climate on cloud cover? Oh, <laughs> they don't, oh you know, 
It's, a, it's not a test tube, it's not a Petri dish. Uh, it's a living organism. It's a living plant, right? Self-regulating, it breathes, it, it has a heartbeat, it actually has a voice, you know? Like all of this kind of, it, it has a permeable layer. It meets all the definitions of life, like a permeable, permeable leather, layer that takes in energy and kicks out waste and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we're messing with that, right? Um, but that does not fit into the scientific materialist models and worldviews. So we're not going, we, I mean, we, it fits enough to know that we have to stop burning fossil fuels, right? But how much do you need to know in climate science to realize, oh, wow, situation is critical. Um, do I really need to continue monitoring it's kind of like with coronavirus right now. Do we really need the every day to be reminded how many people have it, how many have recovered, how many have died? It's, we're obsessed with this, right? Why? Those are numbers. Like, what does that mean? You know, like, I mean, okay, yeah. You, you, I mean, we're a little bit obsessed with it. And it's the same thing with, with, with people that are, people that get into trouble, into despair and doom is because they're, they're focusing on the science. No, they're obsessing on the science. Instead of reading enough of the science to realize this is a real situation, this is a really serious situation and we need to change. Okay, how do I bring about that change? Yeah. Because there's no scientific solution to social transformation. And um, that's a spiritual issue. And so that's why these kinds of efforts, this kind of quantum activism of people around the world coming together and, and forming a kind of mycelium of intelligence, this is part of Gaia's self-defense, immunodefense system. Wow. It's not just people like you coming, us coming together spiritually. It's also, and this doesn't get talked about as much, although in Extinction Rebellion circles it does, uh, it's also people doing entheogen, doing entheogens every day. Circles up and down the coast here of people doing entheogenic substances, coming away at, with a higher intelligence that's connected to uh, the natural world, mm -hmm. connecting to Gaia. This is Gaia is the one who is calling us into that mycelium layer that she's forming so that we can get out of this mess because she has to because we're a threat. Mm. And, um, and we're called. We don't go to this stuff because of it pays money. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm not making any money out of exactly. it. Exactly. Uh, we're called to it by her. Nothing that I'm telling you now is something that I came up on my own, my, on my own brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's all because I continually, as a spiritual practice, open myself up to that larger intelligence, that, that organism of which I am a cell in her immune defense system. And if you open that space, that silence, you open that sacred space alone or in community and i've been doing this a lot with people around the world reporters you know working on climate issues and things on zoom because that's what we have right now right mm -hmm. you you recognize that shared awareness is sacred space you come into coherence through intention and you access a higher intelligence you invite in all your relations up to and including Gaia mm -hmm. and something greater than the parts emerges from that space of shared awareness that's the higher intelligence that is our inner our inner outer guru or whatever mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh, and um, <sighs> And, and that's, you know, that's what she is calling us to do. And that's what we're doing. 
And that's all that's really important because that's that quantum activism, meaning it all has non-local and non-temporal impacts. Mm. And we're all getting entangled in that sort of mycelium. Mm. And a higher intelligence is expressing itself through us, through, through those connections. And I, I gave a five minute talk about mythology. And I said, what is the myth of the human race? We express it in our movies. What is every movie you go to about? Human beings overcome impossible odds. This is our myth. We know that the future presents long odds, you know? And that, you know, that's what all of our, that's the story we tell ourselves about ourselves, mm -hmm. is that we are here because we've overcome impossible odds just to be here evolutionary-wise and everything. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we have a way of rising to the challenge whether it's a natural disaster, war, Hitler, whatever. I mean, good Lord, you know, was there ever a darker time than imagine, you know, our fathers like going to Europe and trying to oust Hitler. I mean, those were pretty impossible, seemed like pretty impossible odds to, to people in England at the time and France. <laughs> but we did with a horrible trauma, incredible, you know. And, but we overcame it, right? Yeah. And we'll overcome this. I, I have every confidence in the world in human nature because I have every confidence in the world in Gaia as a, a living organism with a higher intelligence. And mm -hmm. that sounds religious, right? I just realized I'm talking to Well, you, I, but, but I, you're, I, you're I'm talking... Not you're, I'm not... You're, no, you're talking to a religious naturalist. So I interpret all mythic language as saying something about this one reality in which we live and move and have our being. And so it fits with what I'm, with my worldview deeply. I'm, I'm, I want to hear, I want to lean into both what you mean by climate, climate grief. I noticed your book, uh, it was going to be called Climate Grief. Then I think it was called Climate Sense. What, that, what was that about? But also you've used the word... You've used the word trauma a couple of times, uh, and I know you and Thomas, you know, he speaks of cultural trauma, climate trauma. So I want to I want to hear more. I want to invite you to share a little bit more about uh, the trauma and the grief side of things. Yeah, and that's exactly I, let's um, let's start with the grief because uh, it's a really useful framework right now for trying to make sense out of uh, what's happening. So. So recon, you know, recognize that we're in planetary hospice. Okay, that's a death, death in form life and it's equal parts sadness and joy. And okay, so that, that's where we're at. That's good, that's, that's a good place to be. I mean, you know, I, I'm not, obviously, I, I'm not, I'm saying that knowing I could lose my mother. So you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm just talking about that's life, you know? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's like being alive. But, collect, but collectively, so, so what my book, basically was about, and I have to tell you, I, I started out writing a book about planetary hospice based on the paper. And about a third of the way into it, I realized Americans are not ready for planetary hospice. Right. Listen, I'm preaching to the choir here. So I'm gonna write a book about something that could change the way people think and feel about the climate and crisis. And so, so I looked at it <clears throat> through, um, through the, what is really the lens of, of cultural trauma. So, and, and, and um, I'll come back to, to, to trauma, but so looking at it through the lens of cultural trauma, I realized that something fundamentally changed uh, when we split the atom basically uh, and created hell on earth and declared ourselves to be the masters of the universe. I mean, Harry Truman literally said, we now control the powers of the universe. He said that, that's how he announced the atomic bomb, which they called the cosmic bomb. The Department of Defense called it the cosmic bomb at the time, okay. right? Something from that point forward, we've been lemmings going off this, like culturally everything got really weird mm -hmm. after that. That's when we invented plastics and decided 
that the most natural thing in the world is for a baby to get a formula from a plastic nipple instead of <laughs> nursing. <laughs> you know, we went off the rails, basically, as a culture. We were in such yes. deep trauma. Yes. And if you don't acknowledge trauma, that's where it draws its power over you from. If you don't acknowledge it, you act it out. Mm. So I saw culturally, we'd been repressing that, that, that we, we, lost our, we lost a deep connection with the natural world when we dropped those bombs on Japan. And I say that because as a depth psychologist, from a from standpoint of depth psychology, the two primal archetypes of our psyche are the God archetype and the mother archetype. We took over dominion over the forces of nature from God, and we used it to attack our mother. I mean, not just in Japan. Over 2,000 times we thought it was a good idea to blow up this island or detonate this underground. All, and all of those 2,000 were much stronger than the bombs that we dropped on Japan, right? So this continual assault on the planet with nuclear, with our power of God, right? To me, that psychologically severed something. And I'm not the only one, you know, I've actually researched this and I found, you know, James Agee was this amazing playwright and poet who said at the time, on, on the back cover of, of Time Magazine, the week that we dropped, we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, he said, um, when we split the atom, we split everything. All ideas were split into two. And, and look how polarized we are now uh, as a culture, right? So something fundamentally changed there. But we were so um, uh, burned out on grief and dying and death that we celebrated it. We thought, ah! and, and the government protected us from not, they banned any reports from Japan. So we couldn't see the grief or the misery that we had right so everybody celebrated this wonderful thing <laughs> now, that's a that's a recipe for a psychological disaster right so we repressed and suppressed the grief over the loss of that connection to the natural world and the natural balance of things at that point and then even though grief grief is a at an individual level is not a linear process you know, you, you can cycle through and take them out of order or whatever. What I've proposed and observed is that culturally, it does, you know, everything kind of evens out. And culturally, we do follow the stages of grief. And so I basically did an analysis of how we, we have gone through the various stages collectively of grief since World War II um, in and we're um, um, basically beginning in the, you know, without going into all of that, we're, we're basically right now coming out of, or still in the, the stage of depression culturally, you know, and, and we see that because black is the new black and everybody's piercing their bodies. And, you know, there's this whole sort of like, um, so, um, so that, that's the, uh, the grief component. And the reason that I, I wanted to lay that out there is because now we're going to be acting that out at a, at a, a, on a more compressed time. And we're going to be acting out that same process with the coronavirus. Um, and here in America, at least, and UK as well, I think, uh, we're, ju we're still just coming out of the um, denial and shock and, and still, okay, so it's a good framework when, when people start expressing a lot of anger to realize this is grief, you know, that this is just like grieving. Um, and so it's important for us from a standpoint of compassion and, and being of, of service uh, to our communities to, to recognize that that's starting to come already, you know, that anger is starting to come out and it's gonna become out more and more as we, as we really, as the bodies start piling up. And um, so, and the reason that 
I say that though is because this is a form of cultural trauma. It's, I, it's the first global cultural trauma that we've experienced probably since World War II. And, um, but it's a different form of trauma than World War II because we're all in it together. Yeah. We're not at each other's throats. Um, nobody's trying to exterminate anybody at this point. Everybody's trying to survive. But it is trauma that we're experiencing collectively. And so we need to be compassionate about that by acknowledging it as trauma and pointing it out to people that they're experiencing trauma because that's how you, that's how you uh, resolve trauma. Just the, Thomas Hubel says, trauma wants to resolve itself. If you give it the opportunity and the space of love and compassion, you know that trauma will come up and, and to, into that spiritual container and it will resolve. And something, and, and with meaning, you know, we, we end up at the stage of meaning, the new stage of, of grief, you know, uh, the sixth stage of grief. And um, so that's that, that trauma, but, um, the trauma, writing that book and everything from Planetary Hospice for me on has been field work, you know, like, oh, you know, look how people are responding to this. It was just an idea, you know, I just kind of put it out there and like get all this response. And then I would write another paper about the response. And, and I kind of kept looking at how we were, I kept looking at everything that was happening in the world and in our movement through the lens of cultural trauma. And it was all making a lot of sense to me until it got to the point uh, more recently, like with Trump, when I saw it, uh, that trauma was, was surfacing all over the place in different forms, you know, like the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, like all of a sudden there was all this awareness of trauma in New York Times doing their brilliant series on slavery, you know, like we were all being called to look at these different, or the Civil War monuments, you know, uh, the, the the revival of fascism and racism and everything like all these traumas that that we've always had are all of a sudden all coming up to the surface and I was like what is going on here you know mm -hmm. and what what that finally all that research sort of led me to was a friend of mine in Missoula who runs a grief counseling center for um, children uh, bereaved children children who have lost one or both parents right amazing work, amazing human being. She asked me, um, would you uh, would you do a workshop for psych psychotherapists, <laughs> you know, on on trauma and uh, and planetary hospice kind of, you know? And I was like, okay, and that's like an audience, a target audience I hadn't really, or an audience I hadn't really targeted before that. How do I talk to a psychotherapist? I'm not a psychotherapist, you know? How do I talk to these people that I'm used to learning from? <laughs> and uh, it was uh, in holding the question that all of a sudden, all of my research and experience all of a sudden crystallized with this transmission from Gaia. I could say now, at the time I didn't know where it was coming from, that there, that the climate is being traumatized, that there is a new form of trauma and I call it climate trauma, but from a, you know, for, for a scientific materialist worldview, biospheric trauma probably works better. But basically, it's a global assault. What is trauma, right? Trauma means like wound that threatens your existence, you know? It can be psychological or physical, but classically, you know, like, like the battlefield wound that you don't know if you're gonna die you're gonna die or not on the battlefield, you're grievously wounded. That's the inception of trauma and then everything that comes psychologically after that. Um, well, I realized that, oh my God, you know, like what we're doing to the planet actually, if you, consider, if you accept that the planet is a living organism, which science does now, this is no longer a theory. I mean, it's no longer a, a hypothesis. Gaia theory is, is like, you know, relativity theory. 
We're, we're not, we're not, you know, relativity theory doesn't mean that it's hypothetical. <laughs> okay. If you accept that the earth is a living organism, and I'm, I'm telling you, Michael, that is a Copernicus level shift, paradigm shift in reality. Like the earth doesn't, the sun doesn't revolve around the earth, you know, like earth is just a planet, one of many planets going around the sun and the sun is, you know, whoa, that just changed. We, we, we haven't quite, just like with quantum physics, we haven't quite, we're just getting there to understanding quantum, quantum physics in, in our language and how we relate to each other. If the earth is a living organism, then what we're doing to it is trauma. And it's trauma that has getting to a level of it, it's threatening her life. Her organs are starting to shut down. She has a constant temperature. Okay, if that's trauma, what, what are the implications of that? Now, look, going back to what we know about trauma, which is really only in the last hundred years that we re <laughs> we've reluctantly come to learn about trauma, what we know about trauma, okay, what's different about this trauma than other traumas? Well, obviously it's global, it's universal, right? It's ever present. Most traumas like 9-11 is a classic example of cultural trauma. There's an event and then there's like the memory of the event and you know, and then there, you know, and we, to the extent that we don't resolve it, we keep acting it out, you know, like USA, USA, USA and endless war. <laughs> That's our, we're still acting out our unresolved cultural trauma from 9-11, right? Um, but this trauma is ever present. It's like, it's, it's, it's kind of like a battered wife who lives in a situation that she can't escape from and she's always in fear of, of the next whatever, right? It's that kind of, that kind of a ever present trauma, um, but it's not secreted away in somebody's house. It's out there and we read about it every day in the newspaper and like the wildfires in Australia, you know, a billion animals dying. I mean, this is traumatic. Whether you live in Australia or not, you read about that and you are traumatized. And it's accelerating. It's, it's, it's not like the type of trauma that's, that we can see the end to. It's actually accelerating and increasing. And um, I realized then it's, a su it's, called, it's a superordinate form of trauma, meaning that it's trauma above all traumas. So the, the type of traumas that we know about are epigenetic trauma, that we carry from generation to generation, unresolved epigenetic trauma that we actually actually affects our genetic expression. And then there's individual trauma that we a lot of us experience as children, just because at some point our trust is not, you know, a trusted figure acts in a way that we don't expect. Like, you know, I grew up in the 60s when your father would beat you with a belt. That's not a natural thing. Okay, so so trauma is basically unnatural, is a reaction to un unnatural, something we're not emotionally or evolutionarily equipped to sort of deal with. So it's something highly unnatural that happens in our life that wounds us psychologically and sometimes physically. Okay, um, both, but, but it's both uh, a physical, there's a physical aspect of it and then there's a psychological aspect of it. And what, what used to be known as trauma was just the physical part of it, in battlefield injuries and things like that. And now we're more familiar with the psychological form of trauma and we see how it perpetuates those, those physical woundings. Um, if we don't pro integrate them into our being, then they, they, they shape our, our habits and so forth. Yes. Okay, so, so here's the takeaway point. If it's true, and nobody's been able to explain to me why it's not true, and I've published this paper in a peer-reviewed journal. If it's true that, that climate trauma is the subordinate form of trauma, the implication is that it's triggering all of our other traumas, because whenever we experience a new trauma, it, all of our past traumas become present. This is like psychologically the, the one thing we've learned about trauma. It's like we, it's somatic, we carry it in our body because we haven't integrated it psychologically. 
And then when we experience something similar to the cause, like a, an explosion for somebody who's been on the battlefield, a, a car backfiring or something like that, then it, all that past trauma becomes present. So if that's true about trauma, then that means that there's this superordinate, this superordinate form of trauma that's our climate, that is basically our fishbowl, then that means that it's going to forever be triggering all of the traumas below that, the cultural traumas, like slavery, colonialism, uh, genocide, uh, all of those culture, uh, um, patriarchy, <laughs> me too, I mean, right? And, and then our, I'm not, you know, the cultural traumas clearly are all being triggered. Individually, I, we all, we're all different. So, but I think epigenetically also, you know, that's what Thomas Hubel sort of observes is like, epigenetically, all those traumas are kind of coming up as well. Uh, individually, I, I'm, not, I'm not a psychotherapist, so it's hard for me to comment on that. But I do know people seem to be acting really weird. <laughs> <laughs> People have been pretty acting pretty weird for the last 10 years or so. Last Trump, you know, Trump is the poster child of a traumatized Trump, Trump supporters, that 30% of the people who have an alternate view of reality. From my standpoint, um, it's very clear that, that they basically, and, and I say this with uh, compassion at heart, are kind of the most traumatized um, segment of our population and and so his and he was heavily traumatized by his father yeah. and so he is the father archetype that appeals to all those people that that have that unresolved trauma that doesn't allow them to see things as they really are you know and so so there's we need to be really compassionate about that but it just shows you know Trump to me basically proves that um, all of these traumas need to be brought to the surface in order for us to actually resolve our and come into proper relationship with our mother, with the larger organism. That big trauma can't be, cannot be addressed without addressing all the other traumas um, that are that are um, that are underneath it, sort of. Right, and so that's sort of the this changes everything. That's sort of a take on, on Naomi Klein's this changes everything because everything must change in order for us to address this. Yeah. And then we're doing that. That's what's happening culturally. We, we bring awareness to forms of unresolved trauma like patriarchy and you know the subjugation of women and merely bringing that awareness culturally, collectively, to the inequities of being a woman in our culture brings brings resolution just by bringing our our shared awareness to that it starts to resolve overnight the relations change right black lives matter not as successful as me too movement it's more deeply rooted trauma but it's it's that's why it hasn't it's not going anywhere <laughs> we're still we're seeing it now with the coronavirus, you know, like with the racial disparity of, of coronavirus. It's bringing all those, those um, how the injustice of um, the uh, African American community to light and other people of color, right? Um, so that's, this is actually hopeful. This is, this might sound, some people when they first hear this, it sounds overwhelming to them. But no, this is hopeful because this means that we're already undergoing the transformation or transmutation of the species that we need to in order to come into proper relationship with the natural world which was the source of our separate you know the, the our separation from which was the beginning of this particular form of trauma that i'm calling climate trauma yeah that climate trauma you could say it, yeah it began with um burning uh, fossil fuels back in the industrial revolution. It's clearly, you know, the industrial revolution is part of that trauma. And in fact, uh, uh, just quickly, um, I was looking at this earlier, the uh, Indo-European root of the word trauma, and its suffix, suffix Greek form trauma simply means a whole. And 
in uh, in the uh, the Greek pteranodon root is a kind of biting worm that gnaws away at something. The Latin form of trauma is to rub away, and the the root, the Indo-European root ter t e r refers to the sense of twisting, boring, drilling, and piercing. <laughs> so that's what we've been doing to the plant: drilling, pulling out, you know, fossil fuels, burning them, and everything like that. Uh, it, it it totally um, it totally fits. And um, so, so basically, um, oh, but basically, while you can say the Industrial Revolution or even all the way back to the agrarian or whatever, we know something fundamentally sh sh changed after World War II, the petrochemical industry. You know, the, we wouldn't, you know, the Industrial Revolution and burning coal didn't mean that we were going to choke the oceans with plastic, you know. It was only after the trauma of World War II that everything accelerated. And of course, with the exponential population growth, you and I, when we were born, there was like about 3 billion people mm -hmm. on the planet. Now there's like seven. Mm -hmm. So that almost, all, almost eight. Of, how about calling it the baby boom generation? Is that not a generation of trauma? Boom, <laughs> right? In the wake of the nuclear of nuclear war, we called the generation boomers. You see how we how we encode all of these traumas in our culture, in our language, and how we get out of it is through focusing on proper relations. Where trauma is about unnatural relationship. Yeah, I, I think about it as right relationship to reality, right relationship to our living source sustenance and end well it starts here though it's relate we, it's a relational issue and we need to come into proper relationship with the planet but we can't come into proper relationship with the host organism without coming into proper relationship with each other so there's all this cultural trauma we can't come into proper relationship with each other if we're not in proper relationship with our loved ones and in our communities we can't come into proper relationship with our loved ones in our communities if we're not in proper relationship with ourselves. And what that means is if you're not, if you are not in touch with your own human nature, then the natural world has no hope for you, you know? It's our own human nature that is redemptive and that we have been separated from. And it's acting against human nature that is the source of all of the problems in the world. We know, we call them atrocities. War is monstrous. You know, all of these things that are not, that do not flow naturally from human nature, what flows naturally from human nature is a mother's love for her child and a compassion and cooperation and, and community and love and like all of these things that we feel when we experience them, we feel grounded and we feel like, ah, this is what it means to be a human being, right? Um, those only can happen if we have a proper relationship with our own nature, with our own in internal. And so the people who are suffering the most, you know, act it out and, and become yeah. leaders and things like that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting what you're, you're reminding me of an, uh, an essay that I read a couple of years ago, Dave Pollard uh, wrote one called um, Cultural Acedia when we can no longer care. And he talks about the sort of uh, drawing on scholarship from a variety of people. Uh, he identified eight human universals that seem to be true for all humans in all cultures and uh, eight hum human universal needs. And these eight needs are all so, they're met in spades in indigenous and first peoples uh, cultures in cultures that still live in a love relationship with primary reality as primary. And most of these needs are being not met in um, anthropocentric human centered cultures uh, that actually have a domination mindset of the, you know, it's the difference between thinking that the land belongs to us unsustainable and most of these needs aren't met in cultures like that, or we belong to the land, that sense of, of a greater thou. If the indigenous mind is entrained in its environment and um, um, and 
the environment, the world of the indigenous mind is animated. Yes, exactly. Well, it's not, it's not merely the, oh. the environment. It's, it's Gaia. It's God. It's the creator. It's, you know. Right. Well, it's us. I mean, yes. it's us. I mean, what, how do we, you know, what sustains us? You know, eating three times a day, right? Where we get the minerals from the earth and, and the nutrients and things like that from the plants and the, the energy of the sun, you know, for our food. And breathing, right? I mean, we have to breathe, which is like basically sustaining us and, and actually, you know, the quality of the air affects the quality of our thoughts and so forth. There's that direct connection. And then water, you know, like we're 98% water. And, uh, and so like, like, like the, you know, the, um, uh, the um, standing rock, you know, water is life. Like, like Native Americans say, water is life. Yeah, we, we're water, and without water, there's no life, right? And here's a, here's a really interesting, um, I tend not to read books about what I do, you know. I, I read books to inspire what I do. And there's, there's an author called named David Hinton, who is a scholar of uh, Chinese uh, calligraphy and poetry. And he writes beautifully. There's a, his first book that I read was called Hunger Mountain. And it's like a modern day Thoreau Walden, you know? It's wow. like, it's so beautiful. And it's, and it's bizarre, because he's talking about like how the Chinese write and stuff, you know? And he's hiking up and down his mountain. And uh, it's so profound. And, and he points something out that I think is a basic, uh, uh, that gives us a basic insight into us as um, living beings, which is that water, which we are, water is life, Water is two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen, right? And every atom of hydrogen came from the birth of a star, mm -hmm. and every atom of oxygen came from the death of a star. So we're two parts birthing and one part dying. And that's the balance. That's why life continues, because there's more, there's more birthing than there is dying. Isn't that something? That's, that's cute. I, yeah, I, I, I not heard it that way. Although we did programs, my wife and I have done programs on stardust and, you know, where the atoms and all that, but I'd never heard that, that way of bringing it together. Yeah. Well, uh, well awesome. Ziva, this is, this is absolutely awesome. Um, I want to begin winding this down and, and just invite you, if you were invited to speak to a group of young people, um, what would be sort of the, the heart of what you would communicate? Uh, and then if you were invited to speak to a group of, say, retired people, um, what would be the heart of what you'd like to communicate in, in bringing this particular post-doom conversation to a close? Well, to the young people of the world, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's really simple. I know. I've been trying my hardest as long as I've been alive, you know? I mean, it was very clear to me intuitively that, um, that something was wrong in the world. And uh, the reason I went into law was because um, I wanted to bring children into the world, but I couldn't see myself bringing children into this world. And I thought if I go into law, I might be able to bring them, help bring about the kind of transformation in society that would allow me to be optimistic about the future and to feel good about bringing a child into the world. And I never had any children, so that shows you that I never was able to get to that point yeah. of uh, feeling like, oh, now we're heading in the right direction. Yes. <clears throat> um, so what I would tell children of the world is that, is that um, you know, trauma is cumulative. And we pass on our unresolved trauma from one generation to the next, and it it doesn't diminish, it actually grows as, as we pass it on. And we have finally gotten to a point where this new generation cannot tolerate the level of trauma that we're trying to pass on to them. Right. And so they're, so they're basically saying, no, this is enough. This is yeah. not acceptable. Yes. What you're not talking about is exactly what needs to be talked about. This is what Greta is basically telling us, right? Exactly. And she's, they're right. And um, 
they need to um, they need to realize that they're part of that continuum. And um, in spite of our best efforts, um, we are in this really difficult situation. And it's not up, it's, it's not up to them to uh, lead us out of it. It's up to them to do exactly what they're doing, which is to hold our feet to the fire because we don't have time to wait for them to grow up mm -hmm. and, yeah. and solve the climate crisis. So, and, and we can't, and you know what, if I, if I was to tell a judge or a politician, shame on you, how dare you, you know? Like they would, like, who are you? Get away from me, you know? But Greta gets up in front of the world and says, shame on you. And she, she is the embodiment of, she is like the preternatural child. She's like everybody's daughter. She's Mother Earth's favorite daughter. And so we can't, it works. It works because we can't, we don't know how to look her in the eye. So she, she and the Friday for Future and Sunrise Movement, Green New Deal, they're on the right track. Uh, they shouldn't feel like the, that it's, it's, the burden is on them to solve the climate crisis. The burden is on them to continue to hold our feet to the fire, these generations, and, and to get the, the, um, those out of the way that are not willing to, to lead. You know, they're doing the right thing. It's unfortunate that um, I think there's going to be a lot of disappointment with Bernie Sanders dropping out and everything because, because he was our best chance, you know. But um, we still have to fight for the Green New Deal and all of this. So take the long view and uh, realize that, that, you're, that we're all part of a living um, uh, planet. And uh, as long as you keep that perspective, um, that you're acting in harmony with, uh, with nature, uh, I would ask children, you know, if, if there's one thing, one other thing that they might be able to contribute is, is really to think about that issue of human nature, you know, mm -hmm. because we've lost the thread. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's something that they can really be, make very clear to us what what the true because they pluck they pluck our heartstrings uh for the older folks you know like speaking to all the elderly people in the world right now um you know i would say um i wish i wish we hadn't experienced as much trauma as we we have it's because of the trauma, it's because of our, the trauma that we inherited that caused many of us to shut down, right? And that with the coronavirus, as well as the climate crisis, really all, you, all we can ask our elders to do is find closure um, with their loved ones before they leave. Yes. That's the best thing that they can do for the earth right now yes. because that closure means closure with the grandchildren the the young that younger generation yeah. and so what does that mean well how do you how will you find that reconciliation in your life with all those that you are leaving the world to um and um wow and uh and then i think but i think um for all of us, um, as a Buddhist, I don't place a lot of stock in linear age. <laughs> there's old souls, there's young souls. We who are leaving will be back. And uh, hopefully in a human form, but not necessarily. Um, but all of us right now are being asked to consider um, what it means to be human, what sustains us, what gives life meaning. And based on the answers to those questions, how do we come into proper relationship with each other, with ourselves, 
I can't leave that part out because and and with the with our mother earth because in order to come into proper relationship with yourself as any spiritual being will tell you you have to um you have to create sacred space in your life to do that and now we have this unique opportunity in the world that's been slowed down to carve out that sacred space in our home that place where we can go to ground ourselves every day and to explore what it means to be human in the world right now because yes. that's the existential question that we all need to answer and if we answer it correctly in large enough numbers then we will stop struggling against the natural world we will stop fighting the virus we will recognize the intelligence of the virus we will stop fighting nature and seeing it as an external threat and we will solicit our mother's um assistance in recovering from uh this trauma and that is not rocket science that is simply the one earth proposal and the last thing i would leave everybody here with google one earth proposal because it's going to be before the international conventions on biodiversity in 2021 they had to postpone it a year and it is how we come into proper relationship with the world with the natural world in a way that will make up for some of our negligence in our tardiness in um phasing out fossil fuels and and transforming our our systems of energy and and so forth but uh, um so the the actual solutions are relational they are before us we know what they are um but it takes it's going to take conscious uh transformation at a critical mass in order for us to have the um support necessary for those changes for coming into that relationship at a at a collective level and uh it might not happen in a time frame that we would really prefer and it, it is probably going to end up being a lot messier and more difficult and painful than it's meant to be but um rather than rather than wasting your time trying to have hope for the future put your faith in human nature figure out what you have faith in i have faith in human nature and that sustains me through all through living and dying through difficult relationship hard times um and it it allows me to um have a mind of peace uh and a heart that's broken open overflowing with love because i have a spiritual container that is powerful enough thanks to my teachers um to hold that broken heart without trying to wall it off and you know that's that's sort of the lesson in hospice as well as if we're in planetary hospice now then recognize that a broken heart is a natural response and that broken heartedness is what makes us all what connects us all it's through that what's flowing out of that broken heart um that sublime layer that is underneath sadness you know there's basic sadness about life but underneath that there's a sublimity that sublimity is is our broken heart yes and the only people that we are not able to connect with are the ones who have scarred and close their hearts off because they didn't have the spiritual container that allowed them to leave that uh broken open heart uh, flowing for more information about this project go to postdoom.com